Our reading this morning comes uh, from the last chapter in the Gospel according to Luke. This is the 24th chapter, starting in verse 36, and the passage that Amanda was alluding to a moment ago. While they were talking about this, they being the disciples, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is, that it is I myself. Touch me, see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and he ate in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I have spoken to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending upon you what my Father has promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Where have you seen Jesus? I remember being asked this question when I was in uh, junior high. It was part of a youth group question, and uh, I think that in somewhere in our junior high years when our minds were still trying to grasp the idea of thinking symbolically or metaphorically and being trained up until that point to think very literally, it was was kind of a dicey question. You know, we didn't even take it seriously. We'd be like, oh, there he is. Uh, you know, things that, things that teenage boys do, ribbing each other, saying, what happens when you ask kids, uh, where have you seen Jesus? And uh, maybe we could go outside and find him on the playground, you know, those kinds of things. But the, but the question has remained all along. And, and Christians, I think, for all time have been wrestling with that very question. Where do we see Jesus? I think that the task of us as believers is to be looking for the presence of Christ, signs of Jesus in our midst all the time, and depending on how uh, we are in terms of our current frame of mind or how aware we are and whether we have our our antennas up or whether we are very literal-minded about that, it may be still a particularly challenging question. Some of you, I think, when I ask the question, you know, where have you seen Jesus, you could probably rattle off a, a handful of things right away. Others of you are going to be struggling with that question and thinking about that for a while, and that's probably the nature of that question. I think it's an interesting question, too, because even in the story that you just heard this morning, the disciples and the others who had been a part of these early moments after the resurrection are still struggling with where they have seen Jesus, how they have seen Jesus, what Jesus looked like to them in that moment. So, Last week we read from John's account of the resurrection. We read that on Easter, actually, and then last week we followed up with the same basic story that you heard me read just a moment ago, but we read it from John. Today we read it from Luke, and I think that there are a few differences in these two different tellings of the story that uh, sort of highlight different things. Luke's going to have a little different emphasis than John is going to have. So I want to talk about Luke for a second today. You remember in John's gospel, though, on Easter Sunday, we read the the version of the story where Mary and some of the women go to the tomb, and they find it empty, and then when everybody else runs away, Mary encounters Jesus at the empty tomb. She thinks that he's the gardener initially, and then she realizes that it's him. In Luke's telling of the story, what happens is the women go to the tomb, they're going to uh, help you know, continue to prepare the the body for its entombment. And when they get there, they find that the stone has been removed. They find two angelic kind of individuals there that, that tell them to go on ahead. 
And the women are perplexed, but they believe. Now, they haven't seen the risen Jesus, but they believe. And they run to the room, the upper room, where the disciples are all hanging out because they're scared. They go to the upper room and they tell them, hey, Jesus' body isn't there and we met these unusual people who told us that he is gone and we should catch up with him. And then Peter says, I got to see this for myself. And he takes off and he books it up to the tomb and he sees and he is awestruck by what he encounters, an empty tomb. And he doesn't understand it. It doesn't say that he fully believes at this point necessarily, but he is in awe of what's taken place. Then a little bit later on in the story, we hear about, in Luke's gospel again, we hear about these two men that are on their way on this road to a village called Emmaus, just outside of Jerusalem. And they're walking along, and on the way, they encounter this stranger who happens to be Jesus in disguise. And so again, where have they seen Jesus? Well, he was with them, but they didn't realize it. And then we have the story today where Jesus comes and he stands in the upper room in the midst of the disciples, and he anticipates that they won't believe that it's him. And so he says, look, the wounds from my hands, where the nails were, in my hands, in my feet, my pierced side, it's me, for real. Like, you can, you can touch if you want to. And the disciples are still in awe. It's interesting that Mark tells this story, these three different stories, and each one, I think, speaks to maybe a different way that we would respond to the question of, where have you seen Jesus? The first one is, well, I haven't, but I want to believe, like the women and Peter. And then there's the next one of, well, I feel like I've seen Jesus, but it only dawned on me after the fact, like the two men on their way to Emmaus. And then there's the times that it's pretty obvious that Jesus stands right before us and Jesus is looking us in the eye and we have trouble reconciling that with our own rational intellect. But in this story, Jesus, as I said, anticipates when he's with the men that they're not going to fully believe what's going on. In Jesus' time, there was a widespread belief in ghosts. This is fairly well documented in the Roman world, that this idea of ghosts being among people was, was very much sort of what people understood to, to happen. Particularly if somebody died, and this is going to sound like a horror movie, but if, particularly if somebody died a, a very unpleasant, early, or gruesome death, there was a, a widespread belief that ghosts would then come back in, in the form of those people. So Jesus is aware of this. He anticipates this. And he says, here, feel my hands. Look at my feet. You can see the wounds. You can see that it's me. And they still don't fully believe. He says, I'm not a ghost. They still don't fully believe. And then we get to one of the things that seems like a really out of place detail in the story in Luke, where he says, do you have anything to eat? And it just seems like, what? It, I, resurrection makes you hungry? I, I mean, it, it was, it's sort of a, it was, it's a kind of a peculiar question. It's like one of those details. And again, like we've talked about so many times, when there's one of those weird little tidbits in Scripture, it's probably there for a very specific reason. And as Amanda was talking about with the kids just a second ago, when Jesus says, do you have something to eat? People at the time of Jesus who believed in ghosts would say, ghosts don't need to eat. Ghosts don't get hungry. So this is something that Jesus says because he's further proving to them, it's me. It's me. I'm hungry. And so they broil some fish, apparently. And he eats, and then they believe. It's like the fish thing was the thing that got the disciples over the hump to believing. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a peculiar little detail to the story. But here's, here's what I want to talk about regarding that today. Some of you may be familiar um, with the Catholic uh, activist who, who died back in the early 1980s named Dorothy Day. Dorothy was, was seen as quite a radical in her day, probably would be in our time too, a journalist, activist, and had an unbelievable heart for ministering to people who were, were suffering and really on the margins of society. Her heart broke open wide every single day for the poor. 
And so she worked hard to give the poor opportunities. She worked hard to care for their basic needs. She showed them dignity. She showed them respect. She opened shelters. She opened uh, camps. She opened all kinds of things where she got an army of volunteers to help care for people and going through some of these most difficult challenges that their lives would ever throw at them, people that were living in dire poverty. Dorothy Day tells the story <clears throat> in one of, um, one of her writings that it was Easter Sunday, and she had gone uh, and attended the morning mass, and she'd gone to an early afternoon mass, and finally, Easter afternoon, she did what many of us like to do, which is to rest for just a little bit. And she pulled open her Bible, and she opened it up to this final chapter of Luke, and she read the passage that I just shared with all of you. And as she is reading through this text, she gets to the part where Jesus says, touch my hands, look at my feet, it's me, I'm not a ghost, you can touch if you like. And then she says, she got to the point where he said, do you have anything to eat? And she said, in that moment, I recognized once again where I was seeing Jesus. Because each and every day in the ministry that we do with the poor, that is the most persistent question we receive. Do you have anything to eat? And she wondered to herself, how many times have I been greeted with the presence of Christ when Christ presented himself to me saying, do you have anything to eat? And for Dorothy Day, the answer is, where do you see Jesus? I see Jesus daily in the eyes of the poor. I'd never thought about that when reading through this passage. I just thought it was one of those quirky details in Scripture, like Jesus is hungry. Huh. But to hear it read through the lens of somebody who spends their entire life ministering to the poor, it takes on a different kind of meaning. I think many people uh, would identify an opportunity that they had to serve the underprivileged communities or the poor in their area or even out of their country. You'd identify those as some of the most meaningful moments in your life and times where you felt that you felt the presence of Christ or that you felt that you saw Jesus. That is a very common thing. Right? Anybody that's been on a mission trip, anybody that's volunteered for a service opportunity, any time that's spent some time in ministry with people, particularly from a very different kind of part of life or a different kind of walk of life, I should say, a different part of the world, a different culture, that's those times where it feels like those emotions well up inside of us, we feel the presence of God, we see Christ in our midst, and we say, that was an important thing for me to do. I remember listening to a podcast a few years ago, and they were talking to, it was somebody being interviewed uh, from a college admissions staff, a number of them, and they talked about uh, when they go through their admissions essays that the, that the students write in trying to get into the school, and they said, they were laughing, and they said, oh yeah, there's one that we refer to as the mission trip essay, and it's just that very thing. The whole, the whole idea being, I went somewhere else far away to go serve a community thinking that I was going to change their lives and I was the one who came home changed, right? It's such a common occurrence that the admission staff has a name for that essay, right? And that's the kind of thing, shoot, I think I wrote that for my college essays. That's a common thing, but, but my point in that is, is if that's so common, and if that's the place where so many of us encounter the risen Christ in our midst, then why aren't we doing more of that? How many of us might say at this moment, I feel a distance from Jesus that I wish we could close the gap a little bit? And I would encourage you and myself to ponder the question, well, when was the last time you spent some time with the poor? If it's that common for us to have that transformative of an experience, when we immerse ourselves in ministry around those in need, 
then why aren't we doing it more often? It's interesting to me that when Jesus goes to the disciples and he says, do you have anything to eat? And they give him fish. It's the disciples who receive the sustenance. Jesus didn't say, thank you, I was famished. The disciples believed. I want to encourage you to be thinking about the ways that we experience Jesus. If I were to ask the question again, where have you seen Jesus in your life? My guess is that for many of you, you are going to pinpoint some of those examples. Those days that you spent serving somewhere else. The times that you got on a plane and went to a foreign land and, and offered medical care or, or basic food or creating shelter for individuals in need. And it wasn't even really the act of pounding the nails or, or, or feeding someone else. It was much more about seeing life through someone else's eyes seeing our common humanity, seeing how the gospel message of hope radiates and resonates in the ears of the poor, sometimes much more powerfully than it does in people who are living much more comfortable lives. So I guess this is a call for all of us. If we want to feel that connection, if we want to see Jesus, sometimes that's going to be believing without seeing. Sometimes that's going to be seeing Jesus in disguise, and sometimes Jesus is going to be right before us, and we're not going to be able to recognize it. But time and time again, the place that most of us could say that at some point in our life we felt a connection to Christ, it was when we heard that question, do you have anything to eat? Let's put the emphasis on that question in just a little bit different place. I think when we read that text, and I think as Jesus is actually saying it, he's saying, do you have anything to eat? As in, I'm hungry. But maybe we need to change the emphasis on the question just a little bit. What if Jesus is asking you and I, do you have anything to eat? Do you have the things that sustain you, the spiritual sustenance? Do you have that available to you? Is that something you have in supply? And for many of us, the answer is yes, but I wish there was more. And maybe one of the ways that we can do that is in one of the most basic things that we've ever learned as Christians. That sometimes in acts of love, and service, we find the presence of Christ alive and at work in offering us the spiritual sustenance that we crave as well. Dorothy Day had a quote in that little memoir she wrote. Here's what it says. The mystery of the poor is this, that they are Jesus, and what you do for them, you do for him. It is the only way we have of knowing and believing in our love. The mystery of poverty is that by sharing in it, making ourselves poor to others, we increase our knowledge of and belief in love. One more slide up here. I want to ask that uh, Jay share that now. For those of you who haven't uh, taken uh, the opportunity to do this, one of the basic ways that we as a congregation have every single month to serve those in need is at the First Light Women's Shelter. We have the third Wednesday of every month reserved for, for making a breakfast for the women that are in that shelter. Now, they come from a lot of different walks in life, and, and oftentimes when you hear stories of, of women like this, there are th those that come from generational poverty, and it's a tragic cycle that repeats itself time and time again, but there are also a lot of people who had one bad hop that changed the course of their life. It was one job loss, it was one accident uh, that led to um, a health crisis, or you never know, a terrible relationship. 
The last time I was there, I was surprised to see two school-aged children that were living there with their mother as well. Friends, I think sometimes we categorize the poor as those people, them. I don't think we do it in a, in, in a mean-spirited way or even in a way of superiority, but I think it's an out-of-sight, out-of-mind thing for many of us. Many of us operate most of our lives, most days in our lives, without having much encounter with those who live a radically different kind of lives than we do. And yet I think that when we take a moment to serve those in need and in those positions, we recognize again that common humanity and the need that we have to serve them as well as their need for what we are able to offer. So I leave this QR code up there for just a minute. If you want to, just scan it with your phone. You don't have to sign up for a spot now, but later on today, you can just keep that tab open on your phone, and if you want to go sign up or grab a couple of friends, or maybe it's your small group, or just sign up at random and see who else joins you, but it's an opportunity to go serve a meal. You buy the food, you create a breakfast, you serve the food, and you're out of there by 8 o'clock. And it's a great way to be in ministry with our neighbors. But it's also a way that I'm guessing that if you open yourself up to it, you will feel that you are in the presence of Christ in a powerful way as well. So may this be an opportunity, not even a challenge, but an opportunity for you so that we might all find the sustenance that we crave so that we can answer the two questions. Where have you seen Jesus in your life? And do you have anything to eat? Let us pray.